the fight was done and I was like, Unanimous. I just went for 15 minutes of 30-26 yeah. total domination. I got 15 minutes of cage experience. I took minimal damage. I mean, well, like, well, I mean, we're stitched up a little bit. <laughs> I Minim took minimal damage. <laughs> Both eyes are half closed. You know, I'm doing pretty good today. Yeah. You are now watching the Chris LaBelle Show. All right, welcome to Whom LaBelle Tolls. I'm your host, Chris LaBelle. Now, I'm going to address uh, the most obvious elephant in the room right now. I think a lot of our fans and followers uh, tuned in last week to see the Chris Sky episode that we had on For Whom LaBelle Tolls. Special edition, Chris Sky drove in uh, on tour from Edmonton, got here at like midnight, celebrated his birthday on camera with his entourage, and we had an amazing 90-minute conversation about life. We talked about fitness, nutrition, dieting, some of his uh, exploits on tour and the places he's been to and private planes and police chases and some charges that he's had on tour, you know, as a activist. Um, we discussed uh, the pandemic. We discussed the protocols of the pandemic. You know, we never solicited any health advice. You know, it was, it was brilliant. In eight hours of being online. The video nearly reached 3,000 views. It was well over 200 likes, tons of support. And the next morning I woke up excited. I'd watched the episode twice. I was super impressed with it. Um, you know, Chris Skye has been speaking publicly for 18 months straight in front of thousands of people. So if you're thinking about the fight game, Chris Skye was uh, tuned in, you know what I mean? He was, he was dedicated, he did his fight camp, he was in great vocal shape. And uh, when he articulated his points, he did a great job. And I will say this, he wasn't the man who's portrayed online. He's not the same guy that you see in news articles. Yeah, you know, he's a little flamboyant, uh, by others considered slightly obnoxious, but I met the man and he was insightful. He was appreciative. He was humble. He looked after the entourage that came with him. This guy said he'd be on the show and he came. Midnight, and it was his birthday. He didn't have to come, but he did. The facts that he spoke, they weren't conspiracy. They were everyday conversation. Things that we ask ourselves about the um, protocols for the pandemic and the shutdown and what governments may or may not be doing um, in regards to a fourth shutdown or a fourth wave, you know? But I have to say, you know, he was, uh, he was an entertaining guest. He was insightful, like I said, he had a great sense of humor and he really delivered some points that people wanted to hear. In fact, my DMs have been nonstop since YouTube has taken down the video, man. People were messaging me consistently, nonstop. Where's it gonna go? When are you gonna put it back up? What do you gotta do? How do we help? And I'm not talking 10 or 20 people. I'm talking hundreds of people have been messaging me. They want to see the episode and I wanna re-release it. So LK Visuals and I might go in, might do some edits to it, take out some uh, trigger words, but ultimately I've watched it several times. There was nothing in there that was no more than two guys sitting down for a cup of coffee talking about current affairs. That was it. And YouTube took it down and gave me a seven day appeal process. I appealed it today. So I appealed the video, I appealed the process, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the results are. If they deny my appeal, we get one strike on our YouTube page. That's unfortunate. However, I don't think that I'd have a great podcast if I wasn't getting flagged for something. I'm Chris LaBelle. I am not a guy who sits on the fence. I'm an extreme dude. I will touch on topics that are triggers for some people. What is the point in conducting any form of journalism if you're not trying to broadcast an opinion? That's all it is. I'm sharing mine. Our guests are sharing theirs. It's up to you as the viewer, as the guest to determine whether the information is falsified, congruent, or potentially hazardous. Whatever it is, you're the viewer, man. If I told you to jump off the bridge and you jump and break your leg, bro, you make your own opinion. I can't tell you what to do in life. We're all adults. This isn't a program for 18 and under. It's 18 and older. We can vote. And if we can vote, you can make a conscious decision of what kind of information you choose to determine is uh, viable to your life. And quite frankly, it was a great podcast. 
And I was super impressed, man. I wore a fucking shirt and tie for this thing, okay? Fresh lineup. I fucking hit the gym twice that day. I even went for a tan, okay? And I'm pretty tanned as it is, but I went for a tan. Moving on. There's a lot going on in the news since that podcast. Um, the government made an announcement that all federal employees that work for the federal government of Canada will have to be fully vaccinated and receive a passport to indicate that they have been vaxxed. That's a lot of people. In fact, that's almost 100,000 people in Canada employed by our government that will now be forced to vaccinate to keep their jobs. That's a lot of leverage. The Solicitor General of Health here in Alberta, or whatever the title is, the person that makes the calls for health, has made another decree that all Alberta healthcare workers on all levels have to be fully vaxxed as well. And just recently, there's been news that there's gonna be vaccination stations in schools all across the country. So when children that aren't there with their parents to be able to make a consent in regards to the vax, there's gonna be children being vaxxed with or without your consent. Mm -hmm. That bothers me. I feel that, again, I don't judge, but it's a choice, okay? If this works and the mask work and we shut down, what's with the ballistic approach of pressuring this country into getting vaccinated? It's too much. Like, it's severe. They talk about the next wave and the next, like, you know, the variants. Fuck, I'll be honest. 18, 19 months now, nobody I know has the fucking COVID. Nobody. Nobody's sick. I'm out every day. Every day. I haven't stopped being out. I haven't worn a fucking mask. And if I did, it was compliance to train or exercise or for the respect of others that might be fearful of whatever's out there. And I complied out of respect for humanity. And now they're putting the fucking leverage on us. You got to get it to work. You got to get it for essentials. You got to get it to travel. You got to get it. That bothers me. I don't like being told what to do. In fact, I can't stand any fucking form of order. But I do believe in respect. And we're not getting it. And I don't think YouTube gave us the proper amount of respect as well. So we'll see what this appeal says. Fingers crossed. But right now, I had a good week. I'm not going to let this damper me. I spent four straight days in the fucking most beautiful settings in our Rocky Mountains. I went on four straight hikes. I got some incredible photos and some video. Super proud. Every day was an incredible sunset. Yes, it was ridiculously smoky from the forest fires in British Columbia. Plus, Canmore had a fire on Friday, last Friday. Uh, that was a little scary. But man, I had an opportunity to um, explore Fortress Mountain, a legendary ski hill over 3,000 acres of land in the most prestigious part of the Rocky Mountains in Kananaskis. Uh, Rock Glacier Water is a phenomenal product that's produced on that mountain, Rock Glacier Beer as well. And uh, the owner of that allowed me a day in the mountains. And uh, I got to experience a sunset to myself in a private part of the mountain. And it was the most beautiful setting I've ever experienced in my life. I meditated, um, did a lot of reflection. And I feel good. I feel a lot better today than I did last week. Um, I got a chance to guide. I haven't done that in a while. I took out uh, globally recognized photographer, Damian Gilbert uh, from Epica and uh, Epica Photos. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal photographer. And he took some brilliant photos. Uh, one of Serial Ridge, which is Upper Spray Lakes on the Rawson Lake Trail. Fucking brilliant photo. Um, something that read at National Geographic. And D-Man and I, was his nickname, we've been working together for years. We've traveled to the Dominican and shot and filmed there. and tons of events. This guy has traveled all over the world, Iceland, you name it. And he's shot some of the biggest names in the world. And I was proud. I got a chance to guide him in our Rocky Mountains for the first time. So it's been a great week. And one of the greatest highlights of this week was just this past Saturday, my very good friend and uh, somebody that I've been mentoring and slightly managing in the MMA world is my very good friend, Ali Sharkey who won his professional debut last Saturday. He is now 1-0. He fought for a company called Unified MMA, and he fought against a guy that had about close to 10 fights, including amateur and pro. 
He was a 1-0 fighter, and he was a big guy, man, for 185. Definitely a solid fighter, knew how to strike, um, was able to do a decent job not getting submitted or pounded too hard, and, you know, scathed, but survived the three rounds with Ali, and Ali won. And he won in great fashion, and he was humble. In fact, if it weren't for Ali, over 20 to 30% of the ticket sales came from his fan base, not to mention the buys on UFC Fight Pass. Imagine your first fight, making your pro debut in MMA for UFC Fight Pass. And that's just what Ali did. In fact, I got him in the studio tonight. So, let's interview a good friend of ours and hear about the process of preparing for your first MMA fight. You are now watching The Chris LaBelle Show. All right, guys, we're live in the studio right now at Alavanca Jiu-Jitsu here in Calgary, Alberta on 16th Ave, northeast of Calgary, right by the historical Peter's Drive-In. Um, not my favorite hamburger, but pretty busy spot for milkshakes and hamburgers and onion rings and french fries. You know, old school. Does provide a lot of employment for Calgarians. But in our studio right now, we have a man that is 1-0 in the MMA world. He made his debut just last Saturday for Unified MMA in Edmonton on the UFC Fight Pass. Introducing my very good friend for the second time, Mr. Ali Sharkey. Thanks, Chris, for having me on the show. Yeah, brother, how are you? Good, bro, you? Good, man. So if you see me fidgeting with my mic, it took a little ding the other day, so don't mind me if I fidget a touch, okay? So, Ali, big fight. It was, it was actually a really good one, too. Yeah. It was a good fight, long awaited debut. Yeah, man. You uh, tell us, man. Like I just, you know, I talk a lot on the show, so I would love to hear your perspective. Maybe tell us a little bit about um, just the process. Three months out, like you got your fight, you, you got the name of the guy. You're gonna just tell us a little about the process. You know, it was it was actually tricky because I got the contract. It was supposed to be that was that was supposed to be an amateur debut. Mm. They were supposed to do October was going to be the pro debut in Calgary. So it was tricky because I signed that contract and. Two weeks go by, or was it like three weeks go by, and then Buddy dropped out. So we kind of panicked a little, like, shoot, like, we're trying to get this fight going on, and like, nothing's going to What did that feel like? So you, because you, you've never had, you, it was an amateur debut, you had a guy picked, and he bailed. What kind of feeling is that for you, your training and your you know, You know, it wasn't, I wasn't like mad that he dropped. It's more like, just get me somebody. I want to, I just wanted to compete. So it didn't matter if it, whether it was him or somebody else. I just wanted to compete, and it was kind of rough that he dropped out. But uh, you know, Sonny, shout out to Sonny at Unified MMA. He, he was he was an awesome promoter. Jumped on it right away, and uh, he got me another opponent. So in that case, we're styling now. We're back. We were training regardless. I knew something was gonna that he'd fix it. But uh, two three weeks go by, and two I say two weeks go by, and then this guy he had cold feet too. So then he uh, he dropped out. And then a month before Unified, I also had a short notice in South Dakota that I was yeah. going to jump on too. And uh, that one fell through. So it was kind of getting frustrating. These, you know, it was hard to, uh, to get a fight. Um, long story short, Sonny reached out to me. He's like, hey, we have these opponents that are available for you, but they were all pros. And it was either you take the pro debut now or you wait for October or December to fight in Calgary. And... Uh, I was training like pre-COVID, waiting. Like we were looking for a fight before COVID. How long have you been training in total? Like MMA, when did it start? What were you doing before MMA and what got you into MMA? Um, I'd say probably 2017 when the, that was the first punch I threw actually training. That was at Elite. Shout out to Elite Kickboxing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, Muay Thai. That was, uh, that's where it started. And then 101 Academy, a little bit of jujitsu there. Um, but that wasn't like training as to fight. It was just, I just wanted to do mixed martial arts. Um, but I'd say probably for the past two years, it's been a le legit MMA camp looking to fight and get and in the ring. who's in that camp with you? Who's been training you? Who's so been your leaders? I've been, I've had, uh, I've been with Cardinal MMA since day one with Brad. Justin Basra, he's been a big influence with the, with the training, the wrestling, just everything. Like we be, he's like my brother. So big influence. And uh, Tim at Alavanca too, big mentor. We've been working some jujitsu, and then even in this camp, we're gonna be working a lot more jujitsu. So your next fight, you'd be working with Tim closely. Oh, for sure. Um, I just feel like I have the ultimate corner. Like these guys, when I was when I when I made that walk to the cage, I had these three guys behind me. I'm like, 
there's no way this guy's gonna hang with me. I did, the knowledge that I had, the work that I put in, it was like, it's inevitable. I'm coming here to take this W and I'm gonna go back home and train. Um, did it go as expected? I slaughtered him. It was good. It was awesome. You know what? I would have I would have loved to not knock him out in a minute. Would have been cool. Everybody would have been hyped. But people don't people, even like people don't understand right now. I have no experience in the cage. Absolutely nothing. What do your coaches say about that? Like you've had no amateur bouts. You've you have no ring experience. You haven't done Muay Thai. You didn't wrestle in high school. Nothing. You weren't a boxer. You literally stepped into MMA around 2017 and 2018 you started to train full time. And here you are, your first fight, and obviously you would have fought sooner, but you know, COVID yeah. kept you from fighting. Yeah. But your first you know, swing at the plate is a pro fight. You know what, what was this, what were your coaches saying about a, your, no amateur, just going pro? Um, Justin, since the day one, he kept saying it. He's like, whatever you do, I'm with you. Mm. And obviously Brad was the same. Brad, Brad believed in me from, from day one, but Brad, the only thing he was like, he wanted me to get a one or two amateurs in first. And I, and I totally understood that, but I just got so eager to get in there. And like, b like before the, before the, I wanted to compete, like street fighting was a thing for me, like legit, like I could How fight, real? like I, I could fight anybody anytime. It, it, I didn't care. You say something, we can fight. Like it was, but then when I committed myself to mixed martial arts, like that's it, no more, no more fighting, no more charges, no more bullshit. Like so, we have Mean Hakeem of the UFC on the show. Hakeem grew up getting in yeah. trouble, street fighting, got into Muay Thai, became a world champion at 18, like a young yeah. age, and turned his life around. Would you say that you had a similar path, scrapping, getting in trouble? I feel like it's similar but different. I feel like he got he did that as a young age and then got out. I was a little older doing that. Mm. So I feel like my chances were a lot slimmer to do what he did, but you know what, we made it work. What kind of what kind of trouble did you face if you could talk about it? What kind of adversity did you face when you did get into these altercations? <sighs> it was always just like, you know, assault charges. And you know, it wasn't even like me bullying people. It'd be like somebody would come to fight, wouldn't go their way, and then Kate, let's charge him. And that's basically what I was what I was dealing with. That's common practice these days. Yeah, a lot of people calling people out online, go to scrap, and all of a sudden they're like, get their cell phones out. He assaulted me. Is that yeah, com that's pretty common it's, practice, dude. These days. It's common, but you know what? People don't. Uh, everyone wants to act like a bad guy or, or a tough guy yeah. until they get punched in the face or things don't go their way. You know, they've never been humbled, and then once they get humbled, and and you know what? Like maybe, maybe I hit him a little too hard, you know. But at the end of the day, it's a fight, you know. I'm not really, if I'm going to punch him with 60%, I wanted to take his head off. Um, what did you learn from those experiences? Make sure there's no cameras. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Honestly, I, I don't think it's worth it. You couldn't pay me enough to fight on the streets. You could not pay me enough. It's just not worth it. Okay. Especially, especially when, like, when you know what you're capable of doing, you're like, I'm not doing this. Like, what advice would you give young people right now if they... 14 years old, you know, I mean, think about it. MMA is everywhere. Every, oh, every yeah. Instagram reel, not just UFC, like MMA is everywhere. Boxing, MMA, YouTubers are now fighting. Like, obviously it's influential. And, it and young people now are all wanting to get into the fight game, but they have nowhere to fight. So obviously they're fighting in the streets. What advice would you give to people that want to get into altercations? What what's really happens when you pick a fight outside? I feel like people who fight outside aren't really thinking. It's, uh, they'll just do it just because we're doing it. I'm with my crew, with my friends, or whatever the case may be. But I feel like if deep down you really want to fight somebody, just do it the right way. No sucker punch him. Either invite him to go to the damn gym and fight, or, you know, actually sign a contract and, and be a man about it and fight. You know, don't just uh, stomp on someone's head with your homeboys and then, oh, I fought. You didn't fight. You bullied somebody. That's some bullshit. That, I, I can't stand that I shit. I hear about this. And even if, this, yeah. even if, you know, as a young age, you've, I, I've done, we've done stupid shit like that, but I'm not proud of it, nor do I condone in it. It's just like, you know, I was doing dumb, making dumb decisions, but you learn from them. If you learn from them, I feel like they don't count. If you learn from them, they don't count. But if you keep doing it, yeah, you're a, you're a fool. Would you say these last, now that you've been training full-time MMA, would you say these last three years have been the best three years of your life? Honestly, if I could, I, I would never see myself where I'm at right now. Like, I would never have thought you that never I'd saw be, this life. that I would let go of everything that I was following and be like, I'm going to pursue a mixed martial arts career. I still work full time. You know that. We, like, I've been building homes, renovations, working with my dad, exterior paint. I've been doing that since I was 16. 
just exterior painting. So like, I'm, so tell us about your day. So you work, you work all day. So for the, let, let's the fight camp. Cause that's what matters mostly. I feel like, because that's what, when the schedule actually, like we were going hundred percent, um, every day, five 30, Justin would be outside of my house with a coffee. I'm outside. <laughs> Text me like, yo, I'm outside. So I'd roll out of bed, brush my teeth. My, my stuff would be packed the night before because I, mean, I want to get every minute of sleep and I'll just be out the door. Brush my teeth, open the door, he's there. We go to the gym. First session's out of the way. Um, we keep our work clothes with us, our meals with us because we go straight from training to work. Hmm. Um, we'd work, I'd say maybe like six, six, seven hours a day, sometimes longer, but let's just say average six, seven hours. Um, we'd come straight from work We'd go to Brad's. So right to the gym. Right to the gym, immediately to the gym. Uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, we, were t we had kids wrestling, so we gotta be back from work early because we're training the kids at so five till six. Yeah, we're coaching kids wrestling. Um, so we were doing that. We train at six to like eight and uh, run stairs after that or go with like on a five to seven K run. It all depended what we were doing that day. So hang, we were training three up, times a day. Up, or hang out with me for an hour for a life, see life talk. I would see you. <laughs> Every night for life talks. We, we chatted a lot. Remember, you, you'd come by, whether it was Alavanca or Brad's, like you, you'd be, you were always in, the, always in the scene from day one of the camp, you know? Yeah, man, because I'll be honest, as soon as I... Because, I, I mean, I met you in 2017, 2016, I think earlier. 17, 2016, 17. Yeah. That's going into 2017. Yeah. I was and lifting the gym. Yeah, you were jacked. You were fucking... This, <laughs> this guy gym. benched five plates. <laughs> yeah. Five plates. Back in my day, you bench five plates, you got a plaque. You got a certification from, like, the Canadian Powerlifting Society. It was a huge deal to yeah. bench five plates. Him and his buddies... Fucking sandals, shahatas. Yeah, they would shout out Mike, shout yeah, out Mike. My, my, <laughs> they would literally walk into Golds on pre-workout, just fucking <laughs> sit down, three plates, which is a ton, wham, 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 and then all of a sudden there'd be three plates and a 25 for one. All of a sudden I'd look, they'd be at four plates, and then I'd be like talking and doing my thing, and I'd look over, they got five plates. And this, these guys were like 20, 21 years old at the time, banging off five plates. Their shoulder pressing 140 pound dumbbells. Their physiques and power was like second to none. And I used to always be like, wow, what a feat, what a phenom. And then Instagram, I start seeing these stories. Ali's training, he's training MMA. And I'm like, this is scary. This guy can bench five plates and he moves like a guy 145 pounds. I'm gonna keep an eye on this. We start talking like professionally in regards to MMA. And here we are today, one and no, no amateur bouts and stuck to the game plan. Yeah. Tell us when that, just the walkout, how about behind the scenes? You know, what was going on in the, this, the weigh-ins, the medicals? The one thing, um, I thought I'd be a lot more nervous but I feel like it was just such a long way to debut. I was so ready that there was nothing to be worried about. I wasn't worried about him, about the making the weight, about the walk. Even when we were back, say me and Tim and Brad and Justin, we were just, you know, warming up, shooting the shit, warming up, shooting the shit. And, and I was just, I was just relaxed. I was just like, we're, we're cracking jokes in the hotel room. We knew what we, we knew what we came to do. We were going to come and execute this game plan. We were going to leave. And that was that. It wasn't uh, thinking too much about it because we knew what we came for. Even when I was walking, if you notice, I was, I was marching a little faster than the team. I'm like, I'm going to this cage on my own. They came with me. They know what they set me here to do. Mm. They believed in me. I'm going to go to that cage. I'll see them in the corner. And that was that. Like, that was, that was on my mind when I made that walk. Um, you're a bit of a specimen, I hear. When you went on those scales, I hear uh, you, you must have... I, I saw your stories. You must have been reshared over two, three hundred times. Yeah, it was a lot, to be honest. I was yeah, There was a lot of attention ton, to your weight. You know what? Ton of support. Like, it was, it was crazy how much support. The, the, you I feel you, like you the sold, best like, 20% of tickets there. We, you know what's funny? Even I feel like if, if, we, uh, if we had more time or, like, hard copies, because a lot of... I, I, I had, like, 60 DMs. Not even kidding. 60 to 70 DMs of people saying, can I still get tickets? And I was like, shit, man. Like, you needed to get those months ago because they're sold out. Yeah. I, I could have sold a lot of tickets. If it was Calgary, it would have been a lot easier. But at the end of the day... I was, I'm not in this to, to Monetary, sell a billion tickets, yeah. you know, like we, we, could, we, 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 we sell a good show. I'll be happy about that. But at the end of the day, I was just trying to do what I was trying to do. Like get this, get this fight in and, and execute my game plan. Cage door closes. Cage. Referee asks if you're ready. Oh, I would told my I was like five times. I'm ready. Don't ask me. I've been ready. You were pacing. 
If LK's got time, we'll, we'll put a clip of the start of the fight. The cage door closes. We were talking mad shit. Like, yeah. We were just yapping. You could hear it over gums. the audience. These guys chirping each other before. Because we, we, yeah. we, he, what, what happened, what, the reason what the shit talking came from was because we when we were on the scale, he didn't make weight or some shit, which mm. was whatever. I didn't, I didn't care. Did his purse get cut? Yeah, it was, it was whatever, 20%. I didn't mm. even care. We, it didn't even matter. But uh, he said something. I can't remember what he said, but it was like, yeah, what? We'll see. And when he said, we'll see, it kind of like triggered me. Like, we'll see. Like, the only thing you're going to see is my fist clapping the back of your head, just smashing your face. And... Uh, Not the back of his head, though. No, those are illegal. That's illegal. Those are illegal shots. <laughs> I'm going to give no illegal shots. in the eye. <laughs> but, uh, so it, it was like, we'll see. And that's when I was pacing in the cage. I kept telling him, just give me one minute. We'll see. We'll see. I'm going to show you what's up. We'll see. Just give me a minute. But yeah, it was a rough night for him. Tell us about that referee... Walks out of the way, bell rings, you guys engage. Yeah. Tell me that moment. The, like, really express that. Like, the, come on. The thing was, uh, I thought my heart would be beating a lot harder than it was. It was, I was more collected. I was more, I was calm and collected when I was, uh, when I was walking towards him, just moving towards him. Um, we knew he was a good striker. The guy's got kickboxing fights. He's got MMA amateur fights. He's won an amateur belt. He had a jab and um, an uppercut that was consistent. He, he's, he's got good, like we knew he had good striking. And at the end of the day, I could have stood up and, str and struck with him, but people don't understand. I don't have cage time. I've never been in there. Um, I had a game plan I wanted to execute. At the end of the day, a fight's a fight. You go in there, you fight. But I knew what I was there to do. It was to put him on his back and just give him hell for whatever. I would have loved the finish, but at the end of the day, when the fight was done and I was like, Unanimous. I just went for 15 minutes of 30, yeah. 26 total domination. I got 15 minutes of cage experience. I took minimal damage. I mean, well, like, well, I mean, we're <laughs> stitched up a little bit. <laughs> I you took know. minimal damage. Both eyes are half closed. You know, I do pretty good today. Uh, tell us about this, was a, this was a head clash. That's head I, don't, clash? I don't count that. I don't count this as damage. How many stitches is there? I think these ones were, these are four than two and one. Yeah. But the four was a head clash. It could have been. It could have been me. It could have been him. But I know we clashed heads because the ref was like, "Watch your heads." And then when he said that, I just felt blood leaking in my eyes. There was a lot of blood, actually. There, you know what's funny? It was a big cut. It just started leaking in my eyes, and I was like, "Shit!" Now I can't because I couldn't see a little bit. So I started rubbing my eyes, and I think that's when I scratched my eye too. Is that like a or whatever, like a blown blood, like a blood vessel or some shit? But well, I had to shake and bake the commission to go I shake and bake the commission. Snuck into the medical office after. Oh, yeah. No, no stretcher. They got him laid out on a on a fucking just banquet table. Just me. And he's just he's just laying there like holy fuck, like <laughs> I just fought. And I looked down and the gash was was in like they did a good job. They did a great job. It was great stitches. They did a really good it, job. If, you know when you watch the UFC and you see between rounds and a fighter's eye like oh and Rogan's like look at that eye and it was like massive gash, massive gash. And that was from a head clash. So there wasn't actual physical damage. And these so were the, elbows. So the only physical these were damage, elbows. A little, the, these little two, there. these two were elbows. But that's it. Yeah. No other aches. No. Feel great. I could fight right now. Well, well there's just the two of us here. So. <laughs> I could fight right now. <laughs> you could fight right now. So, fight's over. You're in the medical office. At which, and here's what I was really impressed with. You're, you were humble. And not yeah. just like a staged humble or some guys will pretend to be humble. This guy legitimately, every person who came to the fight, which was 40, 50 people, he shook every person's hand, got a photo with all of them, said nothing, wasn't like, I won, I killed this guy. Nothing. Then, with my own eyes, Lorenzo, his name, was walking up What did to I tell you, though? Lesson. Remember what I told you before the fight? I told you, I won't shake no one's hand and before the fight, at the weigh-ins, whatever, encounter. I'm not going to shake your hand. Like, no disrespect. We might have a problem or not, but I'm not going to shake your hand. Just for what's going on in my head. You don't want to know what's going on in my head. If you did know what's going on in my head, you're not going to want to shake my hand anyways. <laughs> but... When the fight was done, I said, if I earn his respect or he earns my respect, we can shake hands. And you know what? The guy was cool about Very it. Very cool. He, he's, he, I promise you, watch this. This guy will go on a two, three fight. He'll go, he'll go, he'll go win. He'll go win his next few fights. Yeah, he was a good fighter. Guaranteed he will. I'm just a different, I'm just a different level. And that's not to be cockier. I just know what I can do. I know what I'm going to do the next fight. I know how much more I'm going to improve on every other fight, but the guy's a stud. Like, I mean, he, I, heard, I, heard, I heard comments from people saying, that's very Khabib-like. 
you that was flattering because yeah. you know i know i'm not on that level but like the plan is to get to that level and i know that mauled him i will get to that level he but, couldn't breathe no i didn't give him an, an inch of space and every time he made a move i just took it away from him but and then that fight was saturday today's tuesday did you work today you know what's funny? We trained the kids on a Monday, so I walked in butchered <laughs> with my eyes, like just the kids are like, oh, you didn't look that bad in the TV, but now you like have stitches. But like they were so pumped. They were, you know what's funny? Walking in to, to train those kids and just seeing how pumped they were, I was like, that's just worth it as is, just yeah. that. Because we have kids that were doing some dumb things at school and now they're just focused on training. They want to wrestle, they want to do this, they want to do that. And it's like, just influencing those kids, I feel like that's enough. Is that what motivates you? You know what? I, it, now it does. Like, it really does. I feel like that, that is a big motivation, just seeing these kids that are just... They were going nuts. Like, my, I had buddies that were like, the kids were just FaceTiming them, and then when we won, they're like, we got the W, like, we. And I'm like, yeah, we, we did it. Like, we did it. It was like, a team effort. It was a team. Like, the kids felt like, like everybody felt they were part of it, and they were a part of yeah, it. Yeah, you, but you allowed, you allowed that to happen. The, one of the greatest qualities you have is you gave everybody an opportunity to be a part of your success. Yeah. And people rode with you the whole way. So when you won, it wasn't you won. It was almost we like won. we won. We did, and we did. Like we did. I, I fucking Don King that shit. It felt good, bro. <laughs> it felt hella good. You man. know, it was crazy, even like till today. I keep getting messages from my village in Lebanon, KR. They they all watched it. Like they went. Cause I used to live, I went there in 2005 by myself with my grandma. So like, I lived there, I know everybody in the village. Then I came back and we moved back as a, to, as, with the family there for four years. So like, we know everybody there. And then for them to be like, we haven't seen this guy in fucking whatever. And 10, when whatever we do, years. you're on UFC Fight Pass. Yeah, like that's the thing. Like it wasn't even, the crowd was, was a big crowd. Like we had two, there was like, I think two, Sonny said like 2000 plus people in attendance. And like UFC Fight Pass. There was like, a lot of buys, I heard. Dude, there was, it was I watched people that loud. came for other fighters. I watched fans for other people and family members suddenly lean forward in their chairs and watch you start to pummel. And as you did, all of a sudden, hey, this guy's pretty fucking good, man. Like, it's <laughs> fucking Ali guy, fucking Ali. Like, people started to chant. And it started with your family. And then all of a sudden, I looked around, and there was people, Ali. And then all of a sudden, the whole place is chanting you, your name, You want to know something? No, it was pretty wild. No bullshit. When I, was, uh, when I made the walk to the cage, I heard absolutely nothing. And like, people were like, oh, this guy's just talking. I, I did not hear a single person and the people are like did you you see me i'm like oh, i didn't see nobody i seen one person and that was lorenzo silas and that was it i didn't hear no and it's funny because parts in the fight i'd hear the chanting and then it would go silent again i hear nothing well it's tiring to chant i mean like it's five minute rounds we can't just cheer for five minutes. no but still even like i wouldn't hear i wouldn't hear nothing like nobody chanting just nothing even though you guys were chanting i didn't hear anything I just so focused on getting the job done. I felt like the uh, I felt like the cheer coach. Like I felt like a cheerleading coach. I'm like I'm like all right, guys, yalla, everybody, right now, yalla, and all of a sudden they're like yalla, Chris, and then we <laughs> chant, and I was like I I felt good. I was like oh, I'm Lebanese. <laughs> I just like got caught up in the moment. I'm like Lebanese all of a sudden. It was crazy. It was fun. Even I got a split second just when I was walking in the cage. I, I seen Sunny. Yeah. And I looked. I gave him a look. I didn't say anything. I just looked at him like. It's going down, like I told you. He did a great job. Unified MMA, props to you guys. That was, was a proper promotion. Well organized. Uh, River Creek Casino, well done. Uh, UC Fight Pass, I saw some footage of it. Looked good. What was MMA Empire was taking the photos? Yeah, I met, I, yeah I met... Great I, job. Love the photos. I met MMA Empire at the way, and he's a solid dude, Yo, too. Yo, man, great photos. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good content. And, he, and he's on top of his shit, like always uploading, uploading, yeah. uploading. Yeah, like, man, right, fight's done, bam, there's the photos right there. So literally, like, yeah. from his... Like, I mean, a lot of new cameras right now, like, even, like, you know, uh, why, um, good cameras... Okay, <laughs> LK right now is like idiot. Um, but like you know, brand new cameras, these new Sony's and Canons. Like you can literally photo, edit, and send, and you can upload right from your camera. So that's what this guy was doing. So MMA Empire, great photos, great job, great content. They covered you so well. They did. And um, you know, if you guys are want to see some live MMA, and you want to see a man on the rise, you want to see a guy that trains 
twice a day after an eight hour shift building homes, this man is gonna be fighting either October or December here in Calgary for Unified MMA. Or Edmonton. Either or Edmonton, or. I'm hoping Calgary, because that way we can really show our dominance in regards to promotion and marketing, well, mine. And oh, yeah. uh, with his crowd, you're gonna see it. I'll be honest, I've been in the MMA world for 16 years, and I took a break, I took a hiatus. I just, just lost my lust for it. Love UFC, love all MMA, watch it closely, boxing, all combat sport. But watching this guy, watching him train, seeing his humility and just general hard work, I couldn't help but want to be a part of this. I came out of retirement. I feel like, hey, we are now one and oh, and all we do is talk about daydreams and what if and manifest what's this, next? what's next, and what business can we create, and how do we opportunity, like create opportunity from your, like, I mean, literally, from your success in the octagon or in the cage. Yeah. And it all starts with one win, and we got that. We entered the matrix. Well, we, we, we've been in the matrix. Yeah. We're like, living in the matrix right we've now. We've been in it, but like now. Smoky matrix. But now literally like that one and all just tells people like, hey, I'm here. You are. You know, and I'm not going to say, oh, I'm one and all. I could smash anybody. We'll just let them come to me. Yeah. Like, that's fine. Two and going to come soon. Three and will come soon. We'll just keep racking them up. But we'll let, uh, I, won't, I won't do too much talking. That's why, even, even up, uh, up and come for this fight, I didn't talk shit. I didn't m run my mouth. I'm like, I know what I'm gonna do. You guys can all see it. And it's so funny, like a lot of people are like, you know what, you should've did this and you should've did that. And, you, and in my head, I'm like, like I do appreciate the advice, I really do. But like, you need to understand, like those are my first 15 minutes in the cage. That's number one. That's number one. Number two, you go stand across the cage from another man who's, do you think that Lorenzo didn't want to beat the shit out of me? Do you, was it just he wanted, to, he wanted me to whoop his ass? He was just going to let me kick the shit out of him and go home? This man was going to try and take my head off if he had the chance. Oh, he would have. So why would, I, why would I let this man strike when he, that's what he wants? That's just number one. And number two, man, I could have threw a couple more strikes, but guess what? I'll do it the next fight. It just... But, the, but at the end of the day, look, you have Khabib, 29-0, and, and, and to this day or before, like, you did this and you did that wrong, but like, they'll never, they'll, you'll never get the respect you deserve, and I've learned that, so I'm fine with that. Like, I'm totally fine with, with not getting that whole, you did a great job. You, 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 instead, it's like, you missed this, you missed that. I'm like, ah, whatever. Yeah. It is what it is. I got the job done. I'll get the next one done, and I'll get the next one done, and you can keep worrying about what I should do and what I shouldn't do, but I'll still get the job done. Your professionalism is pretty dope in regards to the fact that you've given your opponent a name. You've said his full name. Yeah. Like he earned that respect. With he you. did. Uh, bro. And you guys are just beginning. You guys are fledgling fighters. I don't one know and him. Oh, one and one. So. I don't know him personally. He does not know me personally. But the real, like, the, like for me to be completely honest with myself, the guy's a good dude. He's a good dude. You know, even if we were talking shit or running our mouths, like, we're going to fight. We're trying to entertain you guys. It's not, it wasn't fixed, but like, you get, is that not what you guys want to see? <laughs> Are you <laughs> not entertained? We'll give it to you. But he's a good dude. He's a, he's a, he's a professional. Um, he was able to, like, when the fight was over, it, watch it, he immediately, good job, yeah. bro. Great job, bro. This, that, just compliment him. You're like, the strongest good. fighter I've ever faced. <laughs> and that's, and you know what? For another man to say that to another man, like, bro, like, yeah. Isn't it crazy? You'll beat the crap out of somebody. And he can be like, great job, bro. But that's just what this, that's just what MMA is. It's just a respect sport like that. You know, people are like, oh, I can never shake someone's hand if they punch me out. I used to say the same thing, bro. But until I got into the game and just seen what it's like, like just this, it's how it is. Hmm. It's just how it is. And if you're going to be a sore loser about it, you're going to have a rough time in life. There's a lot more than just fighting in the cage. It starts in there, but there's a lot more once you leave that cage. Look, at the end of the day, the fight's over. It's over, it's done with. That high that I experienced winning, it's over. It's been over. Back to work. I've, I've been in the gym, we, we, we came back, we trained the kids, and we got back right to the gym. Tomorrow, we're gonna come train at Alavanca, I'll do some light drilling and rolling just until I get these stitches out. Back to, we've been back at Cardinals. My coaches have been watching that video a couple times, we're gonna watch it a hundred more times. We're gonna figure out where we're gonna work on, what we're gonna fix, and we're gonna get back at it like, like we never left, and then on to the next one. My man. I'm gonna close up this interview, just like your first one. Keep it tight. Yeah. Keep it condensed to what it is, because 
we're going to have you back on again when you go 2-0. Yeah. This is an opportunity to follow your career. This isn't just a, a one-off. Ali's going to be here for a while. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of good talk about him. In fact, CEO and former founder of MFC, Maxwell Fighting Championship, which was on HDNet, Mark Pavlich. Um, I got a chance to get a quick interview with him, and uh, I've never heard Mark talk about a 1-0 fighter before like he did Ali in 30 seconds. And he said some great things about him. So if you get a chance, what's your Instagram handle so people can follow you? It's, uh, I think it's Ali underscore Charky. Yeah, how do you spell that? It's A-L-I underscore C-H-A-R-K-I-E at hotmail.com. So you guys get a chance, follow Ali. Why don't you hit him up, man? Like, let's show some support. Everybody talks about support local, right? Here's a local Calgarian, raised in Calgary, from Lebanon. This is about the diversity that we talked about. This is the Canada that we all envisioned. And here is a man, a Lebanese Canadian, that went in, trained, fought, and represented our city. And we need to celebrate that. So if you see him around, give him a what's up. Don't hit him. I strongly suggest don't hit him. <laughs> give him a what's up and tell him you're proud of him because that's how people succeed. You don't have to be a business, but you can be a brand. And there's a great brand right here. So remember, the next time you see Ali around, which you probably won't see him in a club or a bar or out for drinks, because that's not what this man does, but you'll see him training, you'll see him jogging, say what's up. Make sure to follow his page. Let's get this guy to the UFC, because the more people that get to the big show, the better it is for all of us. We got a beautiful city here in Calgary, and we need to represent. What do you say, bro? Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate the support from everybody. Like I got a lot of messages from Lebanon, Calgary, Edmonton, just like all my people that I know and they, everyone just reached out. I really appreciate it. Um, like Chris said, this isn't a one-time thing. You guys are going to see me 2-0, inshallah, very soon. And uh, I'm going to go one step at a time. I'm not going to jump the gun, but you guys will see a lot more of me. Trust me. And those who want to see me get knocked out, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> I'll tell you another thing too. You want to talk about influence? Since I started with his training camp, I made a promise to him. I said, you sweat, I sweat. You bleed, I bleed. You don't drink, you don't party, and I haven't either. In fact, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I've lost 25 pounds since we started this journey. And it was what? Fat, water weight, ugh useless muscle how much better do you feel training like look, look real training because like, huh. we train the same we same, same style as just bodybuilding hauling a bunch of weight yeah. but like actually running weights conditioning stairs jiu-jitsu jiu -jitsu, striking pads. Like it's, it's different i'll be honest man it it the training i've always trained hard because i'm 45 years old it's how i look the way i do but i will tell you this the no drinking the no partying the no fraternizing, the no clubbing, and trust me, the shutdown regulations are not weird places to go, people to see. And your influence kept me from, a, from continuing a lifestyle that probably wasn't benefiting me at all. I so appreciate that. I appreciate that. I really that. do. Thanks for having the show, Chris, and I'll see you next time. Yeah, I'll see you in the gyms. Yeah, I'll, we see, ain't going I'll, nowhere. I'll see you probably later in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't going Yellow nowhere. Bye. <laughs> Yellow bye. <laughs> Now watching the Chris LaBelle Show. All right, guys, you just heard from my boy, Ali Sharkey. Man, this guy, one and oh, MMA, as you see, great story, humble, marketable as fuck. And yeah, man, we're going to ride this pony to the top. That's just straight what we're going to do. We're going to work hard. We're going to align ourselves, our brands together. Al Ivanka's on board. Professor Tim Blanchard was pretty impressed with the first time performance from Ali. And uh, I think a lot of people were, especially myself. And I've been around the game a long time and I know a champion when I see one and I know that every fight this guy gets into, it's only gonna get better and better. It's just like the podcast, right? I'm, you know, uh, as far as podcasts go, I'm an amateur. I've never really done anything consistently. Every Thursday, 8 p.m., having a guest, having a structured show. Yeah, I did mushrooms on one show. Yeah, I smoked weed on one show. But those shows are fun. And we've had some great shows. The very first show, we had Maha Agul, one of the leaders of the Palestinian protests. That was a phenomenal show. We've had Mean Hakeem. We've had Ernie Sue from Charlie Five. You know, we've had uh, Christina Jocko. That was the episode that really did well. Uh, everyone's episodes did well, but Christina's was exciting because she spent five years in a Panama prison for smuggling cocaine. 
You know, uh, we've had my son Dominic talk about his arrest at 14 years old. So, I mean, we've had some really great guests on the show. We've had the, uh, man, Jay Anthony was the CEO and founder, co-founder of Top Leaf Cannabis, which is in over 50 to 60% of dispensaries across Canada. You know, and if I'm missing anybody, it's, it's not because I'm not thinking about you, but yeah, we've had a lot of great support and a lot of great guests and a lot of great guests coming up. In fact, I'm pretty proud to say, I don't want to jump the gun, but we might have ourselves next week an official sponsor for the next 10 episodes. And I'm very proud about that because it gave us an extension and some financing to help improve the show. And thanks to Alavanca, we've got a great studio and great fan base. We've hit a thousand subscribers. I can't thank you guys enough. I'm getting feedback every day, mostly positive. And if it's not, it's constructive criticism. Hey, try this, or maybe more structured, or do you write out the things you're gonna say? How about you guys email me, hit me up, offer suggestions, guests. Calgary is not the biggest city, you know, of uh, celebrities and other people, just being honest. But if you know someone that's got a great story, that's influential, that's been successful, especially in business, um, we're gonna be switching gears next month. We're gonna be getting into business. We're gonna be trying to find local business owners, entrepreneurs, startups, e-commerce, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, um, people that have achieved some greatness um, independently. I wanna hear their story. You know, I would love to have, uh, you know, I'm hospitality orientated, so I'm gonna have to get out of my comfort zone and start to look into some different genres of business. This podcast, this is my job. Yeah, comedy, fantastic. I, I miss being on stage, you know, but no one's calling me right now to book gigs which is fine. Um, I've had my success in comedy. I've got the tour with Brendan Schaub, open for fucking Theo Vaughn, Burt Kreischer. I've worked Brian Callen. I've worked with some of the greatest comedians in the world. And it was the most magical experiences. And right now I'm doing the podcast and it's going nowhere. My cannabis infused dinners, they're coming back. Me on stage, 100%. Hunting season's here. So Uller Outfitters, which is Professor Tim Blanchard's other company, he's a licensed outfitter, which means we can hunt. We're taking people on hunts this September for elk and for deer. It's gonna be a great year. And Ali's fight's coming up in October, potentially, his second fight. And I'm really proud to say that LK Visuals, our producer for the show, is very busy as well. So if you guys like the content and you've checked his page out, this guy's for hire. You're not gonna find a better filmmaker or videographer in the fucking city. Not that other guys aren't fantastic, but this guy, one thing I could say, fucking responsible and organized and he shoots incredible work and right now he's killing in the real estate industry he's really doing a great job for some brands and for some real estate agents out there who we should get on the show and that's about it guys you know i really appreciate the feedback i love the fact we hit a thousand subscribers and as you know every week is different i don't promo much online i don't feel like i have to i put the podcast up thursdays 8 p.m and we're getting between two to four thousand views a video I love it. That's tons of engagement. And I could see the analytics. What I really impressed about and what I appreciate is that you guys watch the podcast nearly start to finish. Our engagement in hours watched or minutes watched is huge. I'm humbled, man. I really appreciate that. So with that said, remember, we have some elections coming up here in Canada. And the guy that has kept us locked down, shut down, and forcing his agenda upon us that we either approve or don't approve is going for re-election. And if he wins and he wins the majority of the votes, this guy's going to be in power with complete and excuse me, with zero opposition because he has the majority vote. So if you want to vote for those guys, you know, the guy that's in charge now, remember, this is the same guy that decimated our economy, locked us into our homes, forcing some sort of fucking, um, poke, that's supposed to protect us. And guess what? Nobody's protected. People are getting sick still. So you, you know, like I say, I don't judge, but you can say no. And the fact that he's using the federal government and leveraging employment with the federal government for full vaccination to keep your position, that's fucked. I don't agree with that, okay? And don't think the NDP are any better. Just because the guy's got a cool beard and he's on TikTok and he's a, you know, a polarizing figure. Fuck, man. He's literally the same guy. Okay? Trudeau and Jagmeet, the exact same. You're not going anywhere. 
As far as conservatives go, you know, I don't mind O'Toole, but this guy on his platform goes, if I become prime minister, I'm gonna waive GST for December during Christmas. Whoop de fucking do, bro. If that's as good as you got, you're an embarrassment. Jason Kenney, on the other hand, that guy, now that guy should have run for prime minister. He didn't do a bad job. Alberta right now is probably the most liberated province in the country. I enjoy living here. I love the mountains. I love the hard work. I love the dedication of our people. And it's a very diverse province. We're doing great. And we have all the natural resources. We don't need Ontario or Quebec. Not to ostracize you guys, but your leadership is fucking burying you. We have the resources, ourselves in British Columbia, if they don't put these fires out, right? Notice how nobody running for elections guaranteeing that they're gonna help British Columbia and put these fires out? How do you not extinguish these fires? Can we not mobilize all of North America with bombers and firefighters to get these fires out now? Or are you just gonna let them burn, destroying natural resources day by day, risking homes and property and, well, public safety? They're on the verge of um, evacuating Kamloops. That city's got over 150,000 people and you're gonna evacuate it, Kelowna? Come on, let's get these fires out. That should be an agenda. Let's get fresh drinking water. Let's ensure that people that lost their businesses and lost their homes that are struggling with addiction are cared for. Why don't we give people a choice to get vaccinated or not and not force it upon them? If you choose to wear a mask, make it an option. It's a choice. If you're gonna shut us down again, Chris Skye says it's gonna be between late September or early October, and he says that's when shit's gonna hit the fan. Remember, I am gonna get that episode posted. Yeah, see, the government running the pipes in this place, already trying to kibosh my words. But we are gonna get that episode running. We're gonna find a platform to stream it on. In fact, this Friday, I'm gonna upload that video onto my Facebook, and I'm gonna find a way to condense it and put it into my IGTV so you guys can see the full episode for yourselves. Because I don't agree with YouTube taking down a conversation between two men that are literally discussing current events and they censored that conversation saying that our conversation is not agreeable upon the WHO, the WHO, the World Health Organization. Who the fuck are you to decide what we talk about? I can go on YouTube, talk about heart disease and pass false information saying if you eat 10 cheeseburgers a day, it'll cure your heart disease. That can stay up. I could say lick your fucking neighbor's dog's ass to cure Alzheimer's. That can stay up, but we can't have a conversation about current events and what's happening with the pandemic. That's bullshit. Our freedom of speech is being jeopardized. And if this clown gets rerun and revoted and reelected with the liberals, I'm not even gonna say his name, but he's gonna pass Bill C-10. And that's complete control of all our social media and all internet action. When that happens, trust me, they'll lock us down, take away our ability to communicate, force us to take whatever poison this is, and maybe it's just a placebo, I don't know, but it's gonna change the face of our society. We are entering a brave new world. Whether you wanna believe it or not, it's fucking wild out there. And as long as we have our freedom, let's do what we can to keep it. Because this weekend I got to spend on Fortress Mountain at sunset by myself, overseeing the most beautiful mountain I've ever looked at above a beautiful glacier fed lake with glades of green and gold and giant pines. And I sat on a meadow for four hours and meditated. Life changing. I don't ever want that to end. I love Canada. I was born here. I'm from Thunder Bay, Ontario, right? I was. 12 years old in the 80s, I was here when it was multiculturalism and a melting pot. Now it's diversity. I'm from a country that was proud to have multiculturalism, that was proud of our heritage. We sang the anthem. We didn't shun anybody away. We were the peacekeepers. And now we're the biggest shit disturber, dictatorship communist that I've ever seen. And I'll fucking say it and I don't care because I am allowed to have an opinion. This is not the same Canada I grew up in. We need to change. We need to embrace our heritage and reflect on who we were as a people. And let's get back to helping others because the world needs us and we need each other. 
I appreciate you guys tuning in. Next week, some business.